protecting okay. myself here. Welcome, Matthew Corrigan everybody. from North Fork. Wait, wait. Matthew Corrigan from North Fork, the geographic center of California. Hello, Matthew. Which brings us to the start, which is, this is Activities Across Grade Levels. Welcome, everybody. Totally cool to have you. As you might have already guessed, we have, we have brought somebody with a, with a very low energy issue to, uh, to join us today. And he's going to be talking to us about this, this right here, Edge of Protocols. You're like, wait, but that's not syllables I normally know. You will. You will. And it's a good thing. Oh, look at the good use of the slide. Ladies and gentlemen, Rushton Hurley. Don't forget, Rushton which of course allows us to bring this part up and that will create a very, very, very long sentence. But I am very much in that space that says it is better to have captions and not need them, even if imperfect, than to need them and not have them. Thank you very much. All right, so with that, we thank you for being a part of our little show today. Uh, we are excited to be, to be doing all the different things we do. Let's give a little shout out. And Susan, if, if you were going to explain what's just wildly cool about Fowler, what would you say? Something wildly cool about Fowler is that we are the home of National Raisin Company, which is the such second largest raisin company in the world. You know, and I think it's the, the number one coolest raisin company in the world. Uh, that, at least that, that's that's according former, to my it, research. They could have been the sponsors of the California Raisin Bowl, which I may have appeared in. So thank you, Fowler, for that. There are connections all over the place. <laughs> We're going to send a shout out to the Krauss Center for Innovation. All of the Merit, uh, the Merit people in the chat, feel free to toss out a woot. I see Noel saying Merit 17, nicely done. Uh, well done there. Uh, and furthermore, to, to Cass and Justin and Gay and the crew over at, at the Krauss Center, always good to have you involved in any way, shape, or form. We're gonna say thanks to Richard. This is the not at all boring guy that I work with on the two EdTech guys take questions and share cool stuff uh, webinar, which we did a little early this afternoon, had a tremendous amount of fun doing it. If you missed it, you missed it. But as a result of having registered for this, I am going to send you a link that you'll be able to follow to get back to that one too. Oh, that's so nice of you, happy to help. All right, so that happens every Thursday at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. Oh, but I'm teaching at that time. Register anyway. I'll send you a link to the recording. You're so nice. That's me. All right, and we are excited to meet you. So this is our guest today. John, tell us who you are. Well, I am a formerly disgruntled student. Uh, I was managed to squeeze out a 2.9 GPA all the way till my junior year in college when I got into the advertising department. And guess what? We went project-based and everything changed. So that was really cool. Um, I've been in education about 25 years. I just came off of a seven-year sabbatical. You're like, Rustin, how do you do a sabbatical? Well, I went and worked for, uh, I went and I was an admin for a while. And I worked for Q for a while as a, a C-level employee. And now I'm an author and I work in the classroom. This is my sixth, seventh, and eighth grade classroom, which is blessedly empty with germs right now, but I wish the kids were back. I hear you and, and have nothing but respect for the energy you bring to a middle school audience because I have taught middle school and Oof. boy, did I learn a lot from it. <laughs> Just saying. Susan, who are you? Hello, hello, hello. My name is Susan Stewart. I'm an instructional technology teacher on special assignment. I'm a tech coach from Central California. Uh, I have spent seven years in this role as a tech coach. And before that, I spent many years, 14 years teaching kindergarten and second grade. I do work in Fowler Unified School District and I support about 130 now amazing teachers uh, in this exciting adventure. I also have the role of supporting our new virtual academy um, and the leadership there and our new a uh, group of families who are really excited to just take this online learning thing all the way. So uh, very excited to be here and I decided to have John because uh, John knows the story that John made me the best teacher I could be in 2005. So there you go, John. It's Get your, out of here. It's you. You're the reason why I uh, learned how to teach. Well, that is pretty cool. That's... I just need to stop for a moment. Can you guys do something else for the next couple of slides because I'm recovering? Uh, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the flush in the cheeks will, will, will spread it. Oh, my on. gosh. So wow, my name Susan, is I don't think I've heard you articulate it that clearly before. You're really messing me up right now. <laughs> uh, well, well you, 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 my friend, are, are one who can recover quickly, and I have nothing but faith in that regard. And who, who well, am I, back by together. the way, who has faith? Uh, my name is Rushton. I'm a former high school teacher of Japanese language. I taught some 
video production to middle schoolers, bless their hearts, uh, became a principal of, uh, of a K-12 school and then an online high school. And then I started in 2005, the year we were discussing moments ago, Next Vista for Learning, which is an online library of videos by and for teachers and students everywhere, free to use, free to contribute to, free to download from, all for a student audience, all screen content, my own little attempt to save the universe from ignorance, one creative video at a time. Thank you very much. Now, uh, you're gonna find videos in that library about academic topics, that's under light bulbs, communities, service to others. We've got stuff related to careers, English language learning, advice for teens. You're like, whoa, there's some optimism. I don't know, we got some good stuff. So you know, but if you're interested in any of this, just let me know. Now, turns out that we're gonna start, uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna start giving away a little caffeine every Thursday. So, so if you sign up for the newsletter, or if you're already on the newsletter, but you just follow the link that I'm gonna put in the chat moments from now, then I will put your name in the hat and I'm gonna just draw one of these. And so across, across our, little, our little webinar shindigs, my goal is to uh, pass out a little goodness that way. So you're like, oh, please add that to the chat. Keep an eye on the chat, it's gonna come up. So you know, it's on the way. How's this gonna work today? Normally how this works is that Susan and I We'll, we'll take like these four different, uh, four different levels, all right, where, where Susan will take the, the youngest learners, our little K to two scholars, and then the upper elementary, and then I'll take middle, and I'll take high school. And with each one, we talk about how a particular theme works at that particular level. Having invited Mr. Carippo in to join us, I gave him uh, the, the, uh, the request that, that he kind of organize this the way that works for him. So what he's gonna do is he's gonna talk about the young learners and the upper elementary, as he jumps into kind of the first set of things he wants to discuss. So with that, we're gonna take a look at the first of the edge protocols and, and what's gonna happen is John's just gonna tell me when to move that slide and I'm gonna do it. And I, I make this noise, beep, and that means it's time to go to the next uh, film strip slide. We I'm just kidding. Uh, so basically, yeah, so uh, what I'm gonna to try to do is span multiple grade levels. Uh, Rush and I were talking in the green room even before we were joined by the amazing Susan. Um, and Rushton said, well, you know, what's, what are elements of good lesson design? And, and I said, it's, it's not content driven, it's process driven. Because if I can teach vocabulary and I can teach summarizing, I can teach anything, right? So one of the first things that teachers spend a lot of time on Rushton is crosswords, word searches, packets, worksheets, billable PDFs. And it makes us feel good because I've felt good. In 2005, before I met Susan, I was like, look at me. I gave out a thousand pages of packets this week. But what I was really doing is kind of wrecking my weekend and everybody else's weekend because the packet was going out and things weren't really getting better. So I've experimented on this for a couple more years, uh, for a couple of years, beep. And, uh, and we've really honed this to a high, high efficiency. So basically, the fast and the curious approach, next slide. The fast and the curious approach is give kids one quick rep. And I think, Susan, if you want to jump in at any time, right, you can do this with second grade. You could do shapes, numbers, letters, blends. I could do this with adults, Rushton. I can give adults 10 or 12 questions on something I've not taught on. Boom. I give them the quiz. And tools like GimKit and Quizzes, what do they do for us? They give us immediate feedback. They give us an item analysis. So at that point, I put my Gandalf hat on, my Yoda hat on, with Morpheus, whichever fandom character you want to be, and then I give them another rep. Typically, the class goes up about 20 points in about 10 minutes. And then guess what we're going to do tomorrow, Rushton? Same exact thing, because this is just memorizing. So there's no packet. I don't have anything to correct. Nobody's missing their packet. The packet's not lost. I'm saving trees, all these things. And yeah, this is of a DOK. If you guys know depths of knowledge, this is like a 0.8. It's not a super high depth of knowledge. But for things like math facts or nouns or verbs, super efficient. Next slide, Rushton. Um, the next one I want to share is thin slides. And so imagine this. Um, if I tell kids your PowerPoint's due in three weeks, what are the chances they're working on at the last day, Rushton? Be one hundred percent ish, right? So um, the thin slide concept is is a really a modified. And Susan, I know that if you spent some time in the valley, we've heard of KWLs, right? So I think of this as a KWL, except I'm teaching, and I think 
I, I can't remember who said this first. It might have been Keeler. Teach like the internet exists. So why would I have kids in my circle time with Chromebooks in the cart and say, what do you want to know about bumblebees? Let's let them look at the internet. So a thin slide is basically search for a picture, add one picture, add one word, you get three minutes and you can modify it like four minutes might be what they need. And you put one picture, one word, rain cycle, complementary angle, slip strike fault, ulna, femur, like anything you want. And so it's basically a KWL, except 100% of the kids make one slide in three minutes. And then I take, my model is about four seconds per kid to make a claim or an observation. And again, Russian, I can do this cold turkey, right? So I don't have to teach before I do this. And then my, my you know, the, the lecturer, the Socratic seminar happens very naturally at the end because these kids are now bubbling with ideas. I want to share. I want to tell. Next slide. And so here's an example of how I practice one of these. These are what I told my teachers in the room was share a food that other people should stop eating. I was very purposeful about the phrasing. Share a food other people should stop eating because I'm always teaching to seventh grade. And if I tell the seventh graders to share a food that you like, they will all say what? I don't like food. If I say share a food that you don't like, they will say, I'm uh, socially conscious. Why are you picking on me? So I tell them, share a food other people should stop eating. And guess what we get? Haggis, squid, veal, and then bang, there's mayonnaise. Now the whole class is talking, right? Like, what do you mean? I got to have mayonnaise. The other half is indignant. Oh, I can't stand mayonnaise. So it's generating a conversation. But what's my prep time, you guys? One slide deck shared. How many days a week can I do this? Probably if I'm in a self-contained classroom, I might be able to do this two or three times a day. So that's the thin slides concept. And again, what grade level, Rushton? I can bring in molarity. I could, I could go as far as I want with this. And then one of my favorite things I ever made was random emoji writing. So basically what we do is give kids a random emoji. It's there in the link and it'll be in the slides. Um, and apparently kids are very into this. So you can show them emoji and say, write me a sentence about it. Write me a paragraph about four emoji. And it's just so natural. And it's really, I think, an excellent use of educational technology. I have the kids use Socrative and I make a one question quiz that's a short answer style. And I'll put up four or five emoji and tell the kids the first emoji is the controlling idea. Some might say thesis. And then uh, I need you to make all five emoji in the paragraph talk about the same thing. And so now I'm teaching kids how to pursue an idea. And then go ahead and slide to the next one, Rushton. Then we can do uh, lots of extensions like my friend Megan's done. So they're now talking about having kids write specific types of sentences. So imagine this, Susan, write a compound sentence about the emoji, write a sentence with a semicolon, write a first person, write a third person. So the permutations are incredible. It's very much like sushi, right? You could say, well, it's just, you know, it's just tuna and avocado and rice, but no. Then you have unami and unagi and you can have freshwater eel you can go really crazy on the metaphor okay next slide sticking with food then you can also do a nacho and the nacho is like this you take one of the sentences or one of the paragraphs that was written and you put it in the question and you have every student revise right then so I don't need to teach revision marks we revise right now we just do the act of revising we can skip the little curly Q and the triple under, we can skip that because we can go straight to revision. My goodness, we're in a Google environment, you guys. Why are we teaching triple underline for caps? Just teach them how to revise, right? Teach them how to use Grammarly. You fix the whole problem. So the nacho is really cool because you can have your whole class revise a sentence or a paragraph and they love doing it. And then to keep it happy and friendly, um, the kid that gets nachoed for the day, they get double points. And then also to keep it happy and friendly, the nacho is not always defective. So sometimes it's just needy. It needs a proper noun. It wants to be in first person. So there's all these really cool operations that come off of that, just that one thing. And bad dad joke time, because I know you're a connoisseur, um, Rushton. What do you call cheese, which is not yours? Nacho. 
So what do you call a paragraph which is not yours? Natural paragraph. Yes, and kids really like it. Okay, next slide. And I've been talking a lot, so if you guys want to jump in just so far. As Let John me mentioned, uh, like as we jumped into this, so many of these ideas are ideas that, that we, we don't want to pigeonhole a particular uh, like grade levels, right? Like the, the healthiest environments are environments where the kindergarten teacher and the AP physics teacher can sit down and share ideas and both walk away with cool stuff. And mm -hmm. as you look at these different protocols, that's the idea that you're being like, how might I apply that? And if you, right. are, if you are working with colleagues to say, let's talk about cool ways to apply this and that and the other thing, you're absolutely doing this right. Yep, exactly. And I appreciate how with those activities, like both the uh, Fast and the Curious and with the Thin Slides, that, that idea that it really is for anyone. I can go in with a set of Thin Slides and say, find something that's red, right? Who's that for? That's for my, my you know, first week of kindergartners. Wait, you're going to teach them how to search the internet for images? Absolutely. Because and the color red at the same time. Yeah. That's a twofer. <laughs> right? So, and then I'm setting those foundations, building some of those digital fluencies. So as we continue on and we want them to start creating their own content, then the idea of teaching them how to insert an image, that's done. Like we don't need to teach yep. that after first grade. They should just know how to use these tools. And I love that approach, Susan. We don't stop to do a tech camp. We lower the cognitive load and we do things, which is if I like to use this model, if your grandma is going to cook you, teach you how to cook brownies or brisket, whatever that was, they wouldn't tell you about it for 10 hours. They would go, okay, we're going to go to the store. Here's how you pick a good one. Don't use olive oil. Don't forget the egg. They're going to walk you through it, right? And then by the third or fourth time, you have a 10-year-old who's making you brownies on demand. Does it get better? It does not. Which brings us to sketch and tell. Which brings us to sketch and tell. So thin slides, and these these were several of these were created by my amazing co-author Marlena Heburn. Um, so think about it this way: thin slides are a super super low DOK, but super hands-on and super fast, right? Sketch and tells on the other end of the continuum. If you'll look very carefully, it says explain by drawing, explain by writing, write a. JPEGs and screenshots are forbidden in Sketch and Hell. Forbidden. And so it's what we like. Like almost all of us have good memories of show and tell from school. I don't because I went to a Catholic school and they were too cool for show and tell. So I, I always looked longingly at the other kids. Um, but basically it's the same process. Kids do a thing. They create one slide and go to the next slide. And I've got a really sweet example, Rushton, which is regionalized in your preference. Um, so this is the amazing Stacy Young. She did this in Pear Deck. She gave their kids the actual content. Susan, you can use your actual adopted content if you have the right activity. So they use their actual history content in Pear Deck. They read about um, feudalism and uh, 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 religion in ancient Japan. They watched a short video. My suggestion is keep it under four minutes because it's super weird to sit there and zoom for like eight minutes waiting for kids to watch a video. And then if you look over on the other side, each kid drew something. They drew an image that came to mind. And other than the one that looks like a little monkey man with a big hairdo, I think everybody totally nailed it. And the monkey man might be something really cool, Rush, and that could be totally divergent. I'm just saying it's it's an outlier. Right? Right, there, it's there's, not bad. there's actually some very impressive Zen going on in, yeah. uh, in, in that one. And so the kids have the artistic piece. So you got deep four C's. And then what's right next to it, Rushton? Text. It's dual coding. They are not going to fit. forget this kind of content because they created and then they wrote about it. What's my lesson plan time on something like this, Susan? Like seconds. I need two links and I need to know. And, I'm, and the other thing that's neat is cognitive load wise when i say to the kids sketch and tell they know what the task is all they need to know now is what's the content so beep next slide and by the way that's seventh grade and you could do that on a hot second and third grade easy and you could do that in college right let's do this implications of the second amendment sketch and tell how does a bill become a law sketch and tell go 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 right um, and then math reps. So math reps is cool because math let you had asked me to bridge the, the, the grade levels on this, you guys. This is a literally K-12, literally K-12. So mathreps.com. So uh, go beep. Here's what it looks like in first grade. And I know, I know <laughs> that Susan's all over this because all we do is we change the number every day. And Noel, I see your question and here's my answer. 
on things like a number mania or a cyber sandwich that I'm not necessarily getting get into those today, the assessment is to do the exact same task as normal, but I don't help. So rush and go forward one beep. The assessment for first grade would be pick your own number and do this correctly. I'm done. So I don't need some super expensive, weird assessment that's different than what we do every day. I just say, pick a number and go. Beep again, Rushton, go forward. So that's first grade. Uh-oh, fifth grade. This is starting to look pretty serious, Rushton. But the pedagogical concept is the same. We're going to do about 12 standards. And you'll see in the middle there, I got a low and a high. That's differentiation, Susan. We're all going to do the same task. But Rushton's super into math, and Susan's more of an artist and free spirit. So Susan, your group can do 55, and Rushton, you guys can explore 345. I could even regroup you guys to compare at the end what the patterns are, right? So I'm not giving kids different work. I'm giving them work that fits their skills. So this is fifth grade, you guys. 10 or 12 standards. We do this every day for two or three weeks. Beep, next slide. Hey, let's do some geometry. Change the angle every day. Works the same. We're doing nine, 10 standards a day. Boom, boom, boom. Rushton, you were asking me about trig. Let's take a look. Next slide. You weren't. That's what's funny. Uh, <laughs> it says today's angle right there in the middle. See that where it says today's angle? You guys, all of that work is going to get done in trig every day. And the teacher does not have to teach a unit on each thing. They just explain it through. I think the next slide has one of these built out. Yeah, so that's, that's what the work the kids are going to do every day, Rushton. So again, what's my lesson planning time, you guys? Very minimal. And what's my ability to differentiate? Super good. And then for the kids, the cognitive load is the work's going to be the same every day. How many adults do you think, if I gave them 22 degrees, could complete this? But if kids in my trig class can knock this out in 10 minutes, I'm going to say that's an assessment. That's just, that's my, like that, if they can do all this, that's an assessment. And they now, can pick their own important, angle. this is at this time when people are trying to bring in kind of a traditional mode of assessment and it's not quite working. And we really just have to stop and say, did the traditional mode of assessment ever really work? Did really? it ever really work anyway? Right? Yeah. And yeah. if there is an easier method that allows the kids to actually go through things more quickly, shouldn't we be doing that? We, well, we should, logically. Okay, next slide. Okay, and the crazy math reps people went through and made all of these on Jamboard, Rushton. And Rushton, you're a good questioner, so you're probably saying, John, what's Jamboard? Well, it's almost like every kid had their own interactive whiteboard for free from the Google. And if you're a Google district, you can literally go to jamboard.google.com and this will pop up. So imagine that every kid has a manipulative. Every kid can draw on their screen. Every kid can make notes and you can literally sit and watch them do it instead of sitting and doing things on a dot cam where they're watching you work because that's the old Huck Finn thing. How do you get the kids to paint the fence, right? I love Jamboard in that, in that way simply because uh, Yes, the kids could do their own and the uh, right now during our we're all in different places. The students can still collaborate. That's my favorite part about Jamboard is that right. it can be used so many ways. I can show uh, I can give you your own version and we can all be working in the same space at the same time. Uh, so many of my teachers are using Jamboard that way where kids are interacting, you know, across the grade levels and across content areas. We're able to have that um, small group work right within the Jamboard. Um, and it's very visible to the teacher because we're all working in the same space, but there's still that element of uh, working together. Yeah, in that's the chat. perfect. Hey, John, in the yes. chat, Noel says, hey, fast prep, but assessment, can you touch a little more on that? Sure, well, that was before I made those earlier comments, but it's a very good question, so I'm gonna answer it again. Imagine if you do an activity every day, Rushton, and the kids can get it done in 10 or 12 minutes. When it's time for the assessment, what I'm going to do is, and this is mind boggling for people, I'm going to open up the jam board and I'm going to go and I'll, I'll go Susan level, pick a number bigger than two and smaller than 50, go. And I'm not helping. And if every kid can do skip count of 50, odd or even, standard form, number in words, base 10, if every kid can do that, how's my class doing? 
And this is mind boggling for people that every kid's going to pass the assessment. And I think that's kind of going back to what you were saying, Rushton. Well, we keep believing there's a bell curve and there's, exactly there doesn't have it. to be a bell curve. That's and exactly I would it. strongly encourage people, strongly encourage people to read the end of average. It is a mind blowing approach to the idea that our differences are our strengths and that school teaches us that if you're different, you're bad you're not bad you have different skills and i always remember i had a, I had a student in my film class and his dad was a banker so dad was like a business dude and this kid would stay in his room all weekend editing videos for my class sometimes crying sometimes avoiding meals and the dad said to me on a field trip i'm kind of worried about that and i go you realize that 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 earns you big money in hollywood if you <laughs> that behavior makes you a lot of money in Hollywood, uh, people that run things like Star Wars want people that work like that, right? So the trick is to get him the skills to be there. So we tend to meet, think that school slash academics means memorizing textbooks and A's on tests, but there's a lot of other ways to win that game. And the end of average goes deep on that. Okay, now we're going to get fancy. Now I got my pinky up. Okay, this is pinky up right here. Okay, good. Double pinky, maybe. <laughs> so check this out, Rushton. I don't know if I've shown you this one before. This is number mania. This is the opening lesson, you guys. This is a student-made graphic. This is pre-instruction. This is cold turkey, as I like to say. And they're using a template called number mania that goes like this. It's so elegant and so simple. I haven't seen this executed below fifth grade, Susan, but I don't see why we couldn't. Okay. Every kid gets one fact. So we give them a web page, a Wikipedia page, a video, one number, one fact, your name. That's all that goes on the Google form, you guys. So December 7th, 1941, Japanese attack Pearl Harbor. One number, one fact. Um, 1,200 uh, sailors died when the, the Arizona was bombed. 1,200 sailors died, Arizona, send it. Rushton in five minutes, I've got 30 facts. I don't need to wait a week for 30 facts. I don't need to wait two weeks. It's, it's in. Which can get you Things very that, quickly to, let's talk about what these facts mean in relation to each other, which is a much more interesting conversation than did you. Then you have numbers. detention because you didn't bring me your facts. I'm benching right. you because you know, like that, nobody wants that part. So we're getting to what Marlena calls like the main part of the show faster. So Everybody puts one fact in a Google form that that begets me a spreadsheet. Notice how I said begets me in there. That was sneaky. So that gets me a spreadsheet that I share view only. And now each kid, that's why it's pinky up, Susan. Exactly. Um, each kid can go grab five or six facts off the shared spreadsheet and they can drop them into a slide. Now this is AP level, but there's no reason I can't do this in fourth and fifth grade. I don't necessarily need the annotated bibliography. Now, next slide, Susan or Rushton. So this is the recipe card for it. One number, one fact on a form, shared spreadsheet, one slide each, and then an infographic with five or six numbers. And I know you guys have heard of the noun project, but um, Marlena shared with me um, Flat Icon, which is cool. It's a Google add-on called Flat Icon. Guess why I like it, Susan? No login. That whole login for the noun project is a disaster in first grade. They're like, ah, I don't have a Facebook. So you can add the flat icon. And what I do in my slides that I give the kids is I give them eight or 10 iconic looking things that they can just drag in. And that's how you get the speed out of it. So click and go to the next one. So here's, and this will be in the slides. So this particular one's an article um, from Scientific American, pinky up. Okay, there's a little form to fill out and then a spreadsheet. So go to the next slide, Rushton. And then these are the graphics that I preloaded for the students. And Rushton, if you zoom out, you can see what I put in the twilight zone that's outside of the slide. And I don't know if you're in that mode. Oh, you're in present mode. Okay, so go to the next one and I'll just show you a couple of different examples. Oh, Misty's got hers in now. So I actually go back. We must have truncated that, but visualize this, you guys. You use the flat icon uh, add-on in Google Slides. And if we were doing something on butterflies, I'd have some flowers, I'd have some sun, I'd have a couple of caterpillars, I'd have a couple of different butterflies. I would put those in the margins outside of the slide. So when my third graders bopped in, they would grab three facts, three seems good for third grade, 
they would put those in. They could change the font, the size, the color. Guess what? That's like tech boot camp. And they could drag in the pictures that were relevant. So think how clean that is. Like I can have kids making a thing like this every week and my preparation is almost nothing. You give kids 40 reps of that, that looks pretty good. So there's like the full spectrum, you guys, and I hope I did an okay job of taking it from like the super basic of quizzes, click on the button and you're getting better, all the way to kids making infographics in one class period. As we wind things down, I want to take back to something that John said right at the end there. He has, he has come back again and again to the idea that if, if, you are, if you've got good pieces in place, you don't need to be spending tons and tons of time prepping all this stuff. If people understand, if your kids understand what's happening next because of the language you use around this, you can make great things happen without spending hours and hours and hours and hours creating the next thing. That is a part of caring for yourself. So this is not merely good practice. This is actually how we stay healthy and sane when changes are, are swirling around us all the time. And that's what we do. We care for kids, we care for their learning, and we do so by caring for ourselves. Now, I hope you will, will take me up on the offer of, of maybe even getting your name tossed in the little, the little hat uh, so from which I will draw one through using random.org, great tool that that is, uh, and that we can get like somebody uh, caffeined up a little bit there because we think that's a good idea. I hope you will check out my blog through these slides. You'll be able to find it and decide whether that I'm sharing something that, that inspires you in some way or not. I've got books I wrote. I hope that these are things that might be interesting to you. And if you and some colleagues are working with them and you're like, hey, could you connect with us? The answer is yes. For free? Yeah. Why not? Yeah. You bought books. All good. So if you have questions, feel free to stick around. Uh, but we want to wind things down. So Susan, talk to us a little bit about how people can find you. So on the Twitter, you can find me at Tech Coach Susan, Tech Coach Susan. And you can find things I share under the hashtag k 2 can too. Uh, because we have a community of educators who are really out there sharing what our littlest learners can do. So you can find a lot about what young learners can do um, in any time, remote learning or in our traditional classroom. Uh, K2 can to see a lot of uh, young learners creating and sharing under that hashtag. Awesome. My name is Rushton. Uh, I am someone who likes to see people get inspired by cool ideas and along those lines, Love all the cool ideas, John, that you brought to the table today. Thank you very much for spending some time with us. Uh, stay safe, right? You know, like, to, you know, make sure you're washing your hands, uh, say good things to other people, spread a little peace and love, smile to those who need it. And you've got one, you've got one. I'm, it's not my underwear, it's a mask. I just was wondering actually exactly <laughs> what I've been holding up there. But, but you know, however you make those masks is up to you. Folks, I hope that you have had some fun with this and that, that you will join us again next week because we try to bring you something valuable to how you're adjusting to this whole world of distance, uh, distance instruction uh, in, in ways that will actually be kind of fun for you because we think that's a good way to get there. So thank you very much for joining us this week. We are going to kill the recording, but all of you who are part of our live audience today, we'll just keep talking. So everybody else, we'll see you next week.